On the line with us right now is uh, Di David Dayan. Is it Dayan or Dayan, David? I'm sorry. It's Dan. You got it right. Dan. Okay, great. Journalist, contributor to The Intercept and The New Republic, author of the new book, Fat Cat, the Steve Mnuchin story. Uh, the website, David Dayan, D-A-Y-E-N.com, and you can tweet him at D Dayan. David, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating, this whole Steve Mnuchin story. Um, let's kind of start at the beginning here. Where... Well, actually, let's start at the end. How, how, how corrupt is Steve Mnuchin? How precarious is his position in this administration? And, and, you know, what do we need to know about what's happening with him right now? And then I'd like to get into how he got where he is. Sure. I mean, everything's relative in the Trump administration, right? Yeah, it seems. I mean, you could call Steve Mnuchin the most squeaky clean member of the Trump cabinet, and that would still put you in pretty dicey territory. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the arc of Steve Mnuchin's career is someone who was uh, a financier at the highest levels, whether it's Goldman Sachs or his own hedge fund, uh, his own bank. Uh, and then he moves into the government and is a driving force behind the very policies that benefit financiers, bankers, and, and, and his former uh, colleagues and friends. You're talking about he was a, a, a major player in the tax legislation, which uh, has been incredibly profitable for the banking industry. And for Stephen uh, Mnuchin, presumably. a major player in deregulation of the financial sector, uh, which obviously has benefited his, his former pals. So, um, you know, it, it may not be personal corruption uh, in a sense, but it's certainly uh, the kind of corruption that comes from having a fox guard the hen house. Yeah, literally. Um, yeah. and, and no pun intended. So where did Steve Mnuchin come from? Right. So Steve Mnuchin, uh, one thing that's interesting uh, in this book that uh, I should say uh, was also co-written by uh, my uh, partner, Rebecca Burns. Mm. Uh, so she, she uh, should get some credit here. But uh, she unearthed this quote that, you know, at his confirmation hearing, he says he... Uh, you know, started at Goldman Sachs working on a folding chair, like he was uh, this, this uh, up by their bootstraps kind of figure. Uh, the truth is, is that his father was a partner at Goldman Sachs. His brother worked at Goldman Sachs for 12 years. Uh, his college roommates both ended up working at Goldman Sachs. One of them was Eddie Lampert, who's in the news now because he was the uh, the hedge fund guy who bought Sears uh, and ran it into the ground. Mm -hmm. um, Mnuchin has lived, you know, his entire life, essentially, in uh, the rarefied air of, of power and privilege, uh, and particularly financial power. And so he goes to Goldman Sachs uh, as a legacy, essentially. He, uh, you know, be gets, uh, has a, an internship at Solomon Brothers, which uh, is the company that uh, ends up creating the mortgage-backed security. He worked under Lou Ranieri, who is the godfather of the mortgage-backed security, essentially the godfather of the financial crisis. Hmm. Uh, and Mnuchin was working with him. He ends up going back to Goldman Sachs and running uh, their, their mortgage desk. Uh, he, he ends up escaping trouble there by leaving and starting his own hedge fund. Uh, Dune Entertainment, which is named after, uh, uh, I, I believe, uh, his, his summer home on Long Island or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ends up buying one of these distressed banks that uh, IndyMac, which is taken over in receivership by the FDIC, and he buys it, renames it uh, One West Bank, uh, and becomes what uh, he has been called by critics as the foreclosure king. Uh, he's someone who uh, One West Bank is tied up in all of the issues around illegal foreclosures, around uh, kind of heartless situations of foreclosing on people over, you know, 10 cent underages on their payments. Uh, and uh, he, you know, does that for several years as the chairman and chief, one of the principal investors in, in One West Bank, which he kind of created. How did he bail out of One West Bank? How did he not get, uh, you know, uh, sucked down the drain in 2008? So, so, so One West Bank was purchased after 2008. Okay. IndyMac was a failed subprime lender. And Mnuchin, through his hedge fund, brings in a bunch of investors, makes a deal 
with the FDIC that includes a stop loss uh, uh, function so that he uh, does not take the hit on foreclosures above a certain threshold. And this enables him to uh, lard on fees, profit off of, uh, you know, clearing out the underbrush of all these toxic subprime loans with the government taking a good bit of uh, the, 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 the losses. Uh, and, and, and him uh, and his investors ended up taking the proceeds. Uh, One West ends up flipping uh, CIT, which is another bank that, that's owned by John Fain, who ran Merrill Lynch into the ground. Uh, CIT ends up buying One West for double, roughly, the investment that uh, Mnuchin and his consortium made. So they made out very well on One West Bank, despite the fact that it engaged in these mass amount of foreclosures uh, that, that really uh, uh, ruined wow. people's lives. So he doubled his money. Uh, basically throwing people out of their homes. Hi, you know, this, he's our Treasury Secretary. This is a position that requires confirmation by the United States Senate. To what extent was this history brought up in the Senate confirmation hearings? And, 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 and why is it that the average American doesn't realize that the guy running the Treasury Department was, you know, I mean, literally referred to by his friends as a, as a, as a term of endearment in some cases as the foreclosure king? So it was brought up, and yet it wasn't brought up. I mean, Republicans uh, controlled the Senate, uh, uh, obviously, and uh, Democrats held like these kind of remarkable extra uh, senatorial hearings uh, with foreclosure victims who suffered at the hands of One West policies, uh, where they gave direct testimony uh, to to the Senate, uh, Democrats on the Senate in the Senate. Uh, about uh, what what they suffered from at at the hands of One West Bank. Uh, the other thing that I reported on at the time is that the California Attorney General's Office initiated an investigation into One West Bank, uh, which found what they called widespread uh, misconduct in the foreclosure process, and they they sent this up the chain, and the uh, uh, the Attorney General at that time. Uh, uh, was Kamala Harris, who now is a senator from California, and she was recommended by her, uh, you know, her, her lower-level staff to prosecute One West Bank for these, these particular issues, and she chose not to uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but uh, the, the document itself was unearthed. Uh, it was actually sent to my house in a brown paper bag. Wow. Um, it, 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 it wasn't known about until right before the hearing when we, we released it. And uh, it, this, this did not play really a, a factor. Uh, uh, you know, every, Demo- every Republican voted for Steve Mnuchin to confirm him. Uh, but it did show that, that there was this, uh, you know, between that and the hearings, that there was this real discomfort with with the way that Mnuchin operated at One West. Uh, homeowner activists, uh, foreclosure victims uh, were adamant that this guy was uh, running a foreclosure factory uh, based in in some cases on on illegal documents. Uh, uh, he uh, Mnuchin has has, uh, in my view, perjured himself on numerous occasions to the Congress. Uh, by saying that his bank did not robo-sign when we have sworn testimony from vice presidents of One West Bank saying, I spent 30 seconds putting my signature on documents that attested to me knowing everything about the underlying loan. Uh, it, it's, it's obvious that he, he lied about this over and over again on at least three occasions in both written and oral testimony to Congress. And yet, uh, this is uh, Mnuchin is a kind of guy that just sort of skates free. Wow. Now, uh, given uh, we just have a minute or so left here, we're talking to David Dayan, who's the whose new book is Fat Cat, the Steve Mnuchin story. Um, now that the Democrats are taking control of the House, mm-hmm. is is there enough juice to uh, encourage you know uh, one of the committees uh, that has oversight over the Treasury Department to start investigating Mnuchin to look into this stuff? Or is, it, well, or is mean, this all, you know, safely behind us? Or yeah, again? I mean, obviously, if you're talking about uh, uh, perjury towards Congress, you're, you're probably talking about the Justice Department having to uh, prosecute that, and I don't see that coming. Uh, 
uh, if you're talking about the abuses uh, covered under foreclosures, uh, that's probably a state uh, issue, and I don't see that uh, state of uh, California. really happening. Uh, you know, it, the statutes are done and, and, and people have moved on. Uh, Steve Mnuchin is now in the corridors of power, and he uh, is able to, uh, you know, in widespread fashion, uh, dictate policies uh, that have an impact on, on not just the banking sector, but really everybody. And, uh, you know, when you, when you really look at the full picture of the man and, and his origins and, and what he did in the private sector and how he's rewarding the same people that he palled around with uh, while Treasury Secretary, it paints a really disturbing picture. But I'm not sure if there's uh, a total way out of it, although, you know, turnover being what it is in the Trump administration, who knows, maybe he won't be there even tomorrow. Wow. So he escapes accountability again, this legacy child, Steve Mnuchin. David Dan, brilliant. Fat Cat is the book, the Steve Mnuchin story. DavidDan.com, D-A-Y-E-N.com is the website. You can tweet him at D-Dan. David, thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. Great talking.